Welcome to our panel. My name is Brendan Cox. I'm going to be the moderator today. Uh, we are all from uh, Law Enforcement Action Partnership. As you might tell from my accent, I'm from Law Enfor Enforcement Action Partnership in the United States. My name is Brendan Cox. Uh, as I said, I'll be the moderator today. I'm the chair of the uh, Law Enforcement Action Partnership Bar Board in the United States. Uh, my full-time job is with la uh, the uh, Law Enforcement Assistant Diversion. I won't give you too many acronyms, and I'm a retired police chief from the United States. Um, we are here to talk about uh, a really important uh, topic today about access for psychedelic treatment for law enforcement officers across the world. Um, we're in a crisis, we know we're in a crisis, and we need action, and we need action immediately. So all the panelists here are gonna share their own perspectives, their own stories, where they come from, why they're here, why they want to talk about this subject, why it's so important. Um, to tell you a little bit about um, LEAP, we are a group of current and former members of law enforcement that believe the criminal legal system needs to be reformed. Um, we believe the war on drugs has brought about really a nearly irreparable harms between police and the communities that we serve and that we're a part of. You know, we don't just serve the community, we are a part of the community. We believe that prohibition needs to end. Um, we want to unite and mobilize the voice of law enforcement to support smart drug policy reform and criminal justice reforms that will make communities safer by focusing law enforcement resources on the greatest threats to public safety, not drug enforcement. Um, promoting alternatives to arrest and incarceration, addressing the root causes of crime, and working toward healing police community relations. We also believe that police and first responders' health and well-being is at a critical juncture hence why this topic is so important. Um, and that there's current ther therapies available that need to be made available to police now. Um, and that there's blockades that are in place that need to be lifted. And what better place than to address those than where we are here this week. So we wanna make sure that our voices are here, that they're unified, and that they're heard. We also want to acknowledge that our panel is not very diverse. We realize we're a group of men up here today. Um, we promise we'll do better. Um, we try, we have a group, we're not just a group of men um, that are involved in LEAP. We have a very diverse network. Our executive director, wonderful woman. Um, we do have a, a, a much more diverse group and uh, we, we certainly recognize that what we represent here today uh, does not look as diverse as we could be um, in what, what is a very diverse um, place as we sit here today. So without further ado, I'm gonna have us do some introductions here, and then we're gonna go ahead and start talking about what we hear. So I'm gonna go from left to right to go ahead and do our introductions. Thank you, Brandon. And thank you everybody for coming to this uh, session. Um, it means a lot to see uh, a good turnout for this topic, and uh, just know I appreciate you all being here. Your attention is the most valuable thing you can give somebody, and I'm grateful to have it for the time that I do right now. Um, so my name is Sarko Djerjerian. I'm a working police lieutenant from Massachusetts in the United States of America. I'm also a working psychotherapist, primarily doing work with adults an aspiring psychedelic assisted therapist, and I've had some experiences that I'm gonna be able to touch upon, um, which have allowed me to experience the psychedelics. And I wanna be able to share that information with you. And uh, some of the barriers um, that are there for people to access um, these uh, su substances. Um, also an activist <clears throat> to intelligently bring the war on drugs to an end. Um, and I identify as a harm reductionist. I believe that life first policies are the way to go. Um, and I'm also a speaker with the Law Enforcement Action Partnership US um, and very, very happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Brendan. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm, my name's Neil Woods. I'm a board member of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership in the United States and an active part of the organization in Europe and the UK. I'm also uh, an author um, and sort of full-time drug policy activist. 
Morning, everybody. Nick Glynn from the United Kingdom. Um, I'm a retired police officer um, and I work for Open Society Foundations. I've been there for eight years, which is a big human rights uh, organization that some of you may know. Uh, and I work on police accountability uh, and drug policy reform and other criminal legal system uh, reforms. Hello, everybody. I'm Fabien from France. Sorry for my English, but uh, I will try to explain my, my story uh, later. I am a um, specialist in uh, suicide prevention, uh, so very happy to be here for speaking with you. Thanks, gentlemen. So what we're going to do is we're each going to talk, and then we're going to try to leave plenty of room for questions. We'd really like to interact. So as I said, so my former life, I spent 23 years in law enforcement. Uh, I ended my career as a police chief in Albany, New York. Uh, for folks, New York, you all think of New York City. Albany is the capital of New York State, about 200 kilometers north of New York City. Um, and when it comes to the crisis that we're in, uh, there is a large uh, political context to a lot of the issues that we have going on. There is a crisis of confidence in policing. Um, not just since George Floyd was murdered, although that was certainly one of the key contexts of things that not just happened in the United States, but across the globe when folks saw that video, because that was proof to many people that there were abuses that were happening in the communities that we serve and that we're a part of, and that those, those abuses are real and need to be addressed, um, but that there are real issues. Um, reports of police violence continue to increase across the globe, right? And some of those reports, we can certainly talk about whether or not that's because we're doing a better job of capturing what's happening in our communities and making sure that we're actually tracking it and we're paying attention to what's happening. Um, but we know that regardless of what's reported in the news, crime is actually decreasing. It's not increasing, it's decreasing. So we know that we still have to look at what's happening. I know that in the community that I served, trust between the police and the community was paramount to being able to actually solve crime, to actually being able to build relationships and to be actually, to be able to solve situations that happened every day, whether it was a crime or not. Because for the most part, the calls for service that we were responding to as police officers were actually not of criminal nature. We solved a lot of problems and a lot of issues that had nothing to do with what was on our penal codes. And a lot of times, the community that I was serving didn't look like me. So it was very important that I actually had a relationship. But if we didn't have that relationship, and if we didn't actually make sure that we were seeing eye to eye, we were going to have a problem, real or perceived. The police are the community. The community are the police. That saying, that principle of policing, has been around since Robert Peel, correct? I don't want to steal from my UK comrades, but at the end of the day, that has been there for a long time. So, simple fact is that we cannot do our job without trust and confidence, and we cannot have community safety without trust and confidence. Yes, the lawmakers make the law, the police ultimately wind up are responsible for enforcing the law, but at the end of the day, we need to have that confidence. And we need to make sure that the officers that are out there doing the job are taken care of and have the tools they need to do that job. So this is where this piece comes into, is the health and well-being of our officers. I can tell you over and over again that officers are exposed to trauma. They see trauma on a daily basis, much like our veterans see trauma on a daily basis. And if we're not paying attention to their health and well-being, and we're not giving them access to the necessary tools to get better and to be taken care of, then ultimately we're doing a disservice to them as individuals, to us as an organization, and to the communities we serve. And at the end of the day, we are not serving community well-being and safety. So if we're not meeting those goals, we're ultimately not meeting our mandate. I know that I had officers over and over again who, after those critical incidents, fought through the stigma of actually asking for help, of actually saying, I can't do this. I can't answer another call. This is not good for my well-being. This is not good for my family. 
I'm having issues at home. I can't deal with helping out with, with my children. I can't deal with my partner. I'm no longer living with my partner and my family. I need help. Only to run into roadblocks because the therapies that were available for those officers were not good enough to get them well enough to not only be able to live a healthy life, but to get back to a job that they actually desperately wanted to take part in and that I desperately needed them to ultimately be able to do because they were not only good individuals, good human beings, but they were good cops. They were good at what they did and the community liked them. They were officers that the community trusted that they could do their job. So we need to be able to give them tools. So when I worked with our city psychologists and doctors, and I worked with our crisis team, and it was, what are we going to be able to do with this officer? Our only alternative was, I guess we're going to have to submit their retirement paperwork because they can no longer do this job. When guess what? There was a therapy that was out there. But one, we weren't knowledgeable enough to get them to it. And two, the roadblock block of the fact that this was, is an illegal substance and it, we are living in a time of prohibition, I couldn't say, let's get them access to that treatment. So we were stuck with that. 135 line of duty deaths in 2023, ranging in the United States, ranging from officers in vehicle crashes to being shot to COVID-19 to leftover incidents from 9-11. The average number of officers who take their lives in the United States a year from 2018 to 2022 was 181. More officers took their lives than lost their lives in the line of duty. In England and Wales, between 2011 and 2019, 163 pol police officers took their lives. In France, 78 officers took their lives in 2022. Think about those staggering numbers. Those are just the numbers from the members up here, the countries that we ultimately represent. This is an epidemic that affects every country of people in this room, every country that's represented at the UN. These are staggering numbers. And these are numbers that are actually collected. We know that these numbers aren't all accurate, and we know that these numbers don't include retired officers, and we know that these numbers are underreported. We also know that we have a crisis in hiring, recruiting, and retention when it comes to policing. We have that problem in a lot of different disciplines, but we have that problem when it comes to hiring, retention, and recruiting officers, especially good officers. So if we know that we're losing officers at, high, at the highest rates ever in policing across the world, and we know that one of those reasons is officer wellness, safety, and well-being, and we know that there's access to legitimate, scientifically proven treatment, we need to open that door. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to the panelists so you can hear from them. Fabian, I'd love you to be able to talk about your history in France. I know you have a, a personal story. I'd love you to be able to talk about that, please. Thank you, Brandon. Um, when I joined the French National Police Forces in 18 years ago, I had a single goal, uh, to win the war on drugs. That's because I watched helplessly as my friends suffered the ravages of problem drug use. Some of them even became international drug dealers. So I wanted to be useful, and I joined the police force in Paris to fight trafficking. My first assignment, a man shot in, a, in the head, in the street. And during my first four years on the street, I intervened 25 times for the same reason. Then I move, I move on to the investigation unit. Uh, in this unit, I realized that even if the police do the best investigation and arrest a lot of drug dealers, it has no effect on trafficking. 
On the contrary, as soon as one dealer is arrested, another takes his place, always more violent. I then move um, to the Francis K. des Orfèvres, which is uh, like uh, DAE uh, in the US, um, in the Paris Narcotics Squad, the best group of investigators uh, into drug trafficking. I said to myself, at last, I'm going to be able to work and to be effective in arresting the biggest drug dealers. I was wrong. <laughs> I saw the corruption, I saw violence, racism, and excesses within the police force. Above all, apart from few high-profile cases with major seizure highlights in the media, drug trafficking in Paris continue, continues to grow. Worse still, at the same time, the head of France Narcotics Police is involved in an unprecedented court case. He is accused of protecting his informant, which is the France's biggest cannabis important, importer, who imports around 250 tons of cannabis a year in order to secure major seizure by arresting his client. So I try to alert the police authorities uh, to the effectiveness of this policy and above all to the damage it was causing not only to the public but also to the police officer, the frontline soldier in this war. My chiefs didn't appreciate this, and I became a traitor in their eyes, sidelined, disgraced, and pushed forward the exit. My leader told me, the group no longer trusts you. And the same day, my girl left me. Everything fell apart. And that day, I was too much suffering, I went to my, my first police station um, in my car, locked myself inside, and put my gun in my mouth, ready to fire. I was an hellish loop in which I wasn't lucid. I was in too much pain. Then a mir miracle happened. The car alarm went off and woke me up from this nightmare. I consider lucky. Uh, myself very lucky to be t talking to you today. And because of this drugs war and the violence inside the police, I suffer now from PTSD, like many of my colleagues in France. In my case, after that, I couldn't stand the medication. Uh, what enabled me to speak freely without fear was a therapy with MDMA, with psilocybin or even LSD. It's ironic, I know, because the drugs I wanted to fight ended up saving my life. I think it's important to talk about my experience because I'm not the only police officer in this situation. Over the last 25 years in France, in the only national police forces, 1,200 police officers takes their lives, 1,200. There is an urgent need to get people talking and to offer every possible solution to police officers, and I think psychedelics are one of these solutions. Obviously, we must stop the drug war. Thank you. Wow, follow that. Um, thanks, Fabian. Um, I'm also diagnosed with uh, complex PTSD. It took um, seven years to get a diagnosis, which is completely common. Most people take that long to get diagnosed. But I also have a diagnosis of moral injury. It took three psychiatrists and multiple psychiatric nurses and various therapists to work out that that was a, an, an additional complex nature of my condition. Now, I've, I've done a lot of social media. I do lots of interviews. I'm very public about the fact that I suffer from PTSD. And that has meant that I've been contacted by police officers from all over the world who are very grateful for me to try and break down the stigma and talk about this publicly. 
So I'm in, I'm in contact, constant, constant contact with many of these officers. And they all have something in common, although they all have a few things in common. One, one of those things in common is that all of them have suffered their PTSD or moral injury as a result of fighting on the front line of the war on drugs. I mean, every single one of them. I'll give you a couple of examples. One, uh, who was a detective I knew, actually. He was a very gentle soul as a detective, very kind, very quiet. And his, his PTSD manifested when he drove a car into a wall, straight into a wall. And he was ostracized and treated with suspicion, as we all are when we, when we have a mental health breakdown within policing. And nowadays, um, he has developed a symptom of PTSD which is very common, which I myself am very grateful I do not suffer from, and that is uh, a temper, an extreme temper. So that when he has medical appointments, he has to be accompanied because his temper has become legendary within uh, with his, his medical practitioners. He has to be chaperoned because he gets so angry. I'm very grateful that that is not a symptom that I personally have. Another uh, colleague who used to do exactly the same kind of undercover work that I did, he now, um, his symptoms are again significantly worse than mine. He can't leave his house without his support dog. So he spends most of his time indoors doing very little and he can disassociate and lose entire days. That's why his support dog is there to look after him. Now, he also suffers from moral injury. And when we talk, and we talk often, he, he's explained to me where some of his triggers come from. And one of his PTSD uh, events is when he got attacked by a drug dealing gang and they beat him so badly, they kicked him on the floor until his, they broke his back. And he was left, and he's left now with life-changing industries and he, in, injuries, and he has a fentanyl patch to deal with the pain every day. But he says, that's not my worst nightmare. My worst nightmare is uh, somebody who committed suicide. Now, in, in the United Kingdom, there was, we went through a period of time where, where officers were encouraged to uh, target specifically regular offenders, prolific offenders. And so his sergeant instructed him to, whenever he saw this particular problematic heroin consumer, he would, he would stop him and stop and search him. Like every time he saw him, that was an instruction from his sergeant. And he, so he did as he was told. That problematic heroin user then took his own life and named that officer in his suicide note as one of the people that was adding to his pressures. So my colleague may well have all of the trauma of his physical attacks, but the thing that's affected him most is the guilt about the harm that he caused to somebody else. I have moral injury uh, myself. I've had more near-death experiences than I can actually count, honestly. Uh, maybe I've blanked several of them out. I've had a samurai sword to my throat. I've been stripped at gunpoint. Various events like that. But again, the thing that haunts me most of all is the harm that I've caused to other people. One example is quite similar to my friend Nick's. Um, one of the people I manipulated when working undercover, when he was in police custody, he ended up being on suicide watch. And that's because whilst undercover, he believed I was his one friend in the world, the one person he could talk to. And so that betrayal was what made him suicidal. Now, that affects me as a human being, that I have caused that harm to another human being. I've caused that harm. And this is the origin of moral injury. Now, moral injury was first identified uh, as a psychological uh, trauma, as, as a medical condition, in veterans returning from the Vietnam War. Now, we, we, we think of PTSD as being uh, a military thing, and moral injury as being a military thing. But a good friend of mine, who was a former, former military veteran, uh, says to me, well, I've dealt with my PTSD in one way, because what helps me, he said, is I can leave that my battlefield is in another country. He said, I wonder how you feel that your battlefield is in the streets you walk, walk into every day. So the point I'm trying to make that is to not to minimise or compare people's suffering and trauma, because people's suffering and trauma is individual. But what I'm trying to say in that comparison is that trauma for police officers has extra complications. It's really complicated. 
But I have to emphasize that all of these examples I've talked about are all because of what police are tasked to do because of a punitive drug policy. Prohibition really is very much at the heart of this problem. That's not to say that police don't deal with trauma every day, they do. You know, I have horrific memories of being involved in, in, in uh, terrible, dealing with terrible car crashes or dealing with, with suicides or, or people who have suffered serious sexual violence. All of these things add up. And one psychiatrist uh, described it to me as, as the death of a thousand cuts, which wasn't necessarily a helpful comment from a psychiatrist, but it did sort of help me understand that this is a multi-layered thing. And it was also, it also, I learned to understand that when I did my first, last operation, I was already suffering from PTSD. And so everything else was layered on top of that, and it becomes complicated. So this is urgent. It is not just a, a policing crisis, but a political crisis. And a great step in helping police and helping the community, and also edging us along towards a sensible drug policy would be to make sure that we can get psychedelic therapy for police right now. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Nick Lynn. Um, I was a police officer for 30 years in the United Kingdom. I did many different jobs as a constable, which is like right at the start, at the bottom level, right up to roles at chief inspector level. Uh, I've been on the front line and I've also managed lots of police officers in many different scenarios. As I said in my intro, for the last eight years I've worked for Open Society Foundations uh, and actually one of the reasons I ended up working for Open Society Foundations because um, I found... Um, it problematic the way in which the police, my colleagues, um, were using our powers, particularly stop and search, actually. So I worked with Open Society for 10 years before I retired from the police, and I've been there uh, for eight years since. As you've heard, police officers, in t and indeed lots of first responders, deal with trauma over and over again, their own as well as other people's. I have been to hundreds of car crashes, fights, murders, sudden deaths, protests, suicides. I've actually been to three plane crashes in my policing career. And all of this has an effect. You get trauma. It can result in PTSD um, and a host of other uh, unhealthy side effects. Although I've never been diagnosed with PTSD, there must be some scars but many of my scars come from inside policing, the way I was treated by my colleagues. And those scars are also from the way I, as a black man, have been treated by police officers in the streets, being stopped and searched, uh, being assaulted by the police, sometimes even when they, they knew I was a police officer. And when you complain, that makes it even worse. You get targeted because you complain. But who suffers from police-initiated harm the most? Black and brown people, indigenous people, people lower down the social hierarchy or caste system, or other social minorities like LGBTQ plus people. This disparity is seen globally, and whilst police brutality, corruption, and abuse of power happens all over the world, it hits us as in the list of groups of people that I just read out, the hardest. It has different labels, race disproportionality, race disparity, unconscious bias, but what it is is racism, classism, and many other isms. Uh, maybe none of this is surprising. If you think about the way in which policing was developed, the foundations on which it's built were racist. Um, depending on and reinforcing social hierarchies. So these defects, the racism, for example, are structural. It's institutional racism, but it lives and breathes in individual officers as well. When officers join the police in the UK, and, but all over the, all over the world, they, they read some sort of declaration, um, and they say, I did it in 1985, actually, a long time ago, 
uh, saying that they will protect life and property. And they do. But whose lives and whose property is prioritised? And why is some property prioritised over other people's lives? Policing is a, a, a flawed model which actually can't be fixed. We need new ways of making people and communities safe. We need long-term investment, funding, support, time for those new ways of working to succeed and thrive or to fail and learn. We need all of that. That will ulti ultimately mean fewer police officers and less policing in its current form, with communities themselves finding better ways of keeping everyone safe. That will take time, lots of it. In the meantime, we've got the current system of policing and we have to work with that. But if we do all the same things that we've done for the last 40, 50, 60, however many years it is, we will get the same results. So we have to try new things. So how do we end up in this session, or how do we make the leap to this session, I, I included that pun in there, to psychedelics for police? Giving cops mushrooms, LSD, ecstasy, to give them their Netflix names. Sounds a bit crazy on the face of it. You know this saying, hurt people hurt people. Well, remember this one. Hurt cops with their trauma and PTSD hurt people. This happens when they're at work. It happens when they're dealing with the public, with their colleagues, but it also happens when they're at home as well. And this hurt, hurts black and brown people and the others I've listed uh, the hardest too. By the way, the so-called war on drugs is similarly built on racist and discriminatory foundations and, you know, we need to throw that in the bin, but I, I won't elaborate back on that. Back to the psychedelics. I'm not suggesting um, treating police officers' trauma with psychedelics is the solution. It's not. Policing needs structural reform and a reimagining of community safety with the right resources to back that up. And we need an end to the prohibition of drugs and to deal with all substances in a way that prioritizes harm reduction, health, legal regulation, education, all the things that we know actually work. But as we travel along that road, treating cops suffering from trauma with psychedelics might reduce some harms for cops and the public. It could reduce the racist outcomes from a flawed system. It would be irresponsible for us not to try it. And psychedelics are a good thing. Psychedelics can do good things for people, including cops. I'm smiling for a reason when I say those words. So we need your help to support these ideas, to discuss them, share them, to be open to acknowledging that we have to tr try new things to get different, better results. Psychedelics for cops might just be one of them. Thank you. So, I'm still in policing. <clears throat> and uh, my career's spanned 15 years. So I've done patrol work, frontline sergeant, and then got elevated to lieutenant. And um, while I was a patrol officer, I'm gonna go into this because I think it's important. Um, I just, I, I noticed that we had a lot of information in the police systems that we weren't using. Um, the police systems that are full of information that the detectives use to make cases for court. Um, luckily, in my community, I was given permission to use that same data set to search for people, just like the detectives do, to find them and try to connect with them on a heart level, get them to trust me, so that I could offer them what they needed to keep them out of cages and coffins. I bring that up because I hope that that can help reimagine what policing could look like in the future. Now, I'm not saying we don't need good detective work, because violence is inherent to the human creature. It happens. And sometimes violence must be investigated in a careful and competent way to create a case for court that's rock solid 
And we all need to know that that can happen if we're the victims of violence. But there's a gap, and we can fill it if we're allowed, like my friend said, to experiment. And why shouldn't we? I think our people deserve that. Our police officers deserve it as well. So I want to touch upon something. Uh, it's the unscientific nature of Schedule 1. Now, we know this is the case. And I'm going to point one thing out here. And we can go on for a two-hour discussion about this. But when you have fentanyl listed as a medicine, right, and you have plants, cacti, and fungi on Schedule 1 that have been used for centuries for self-care, you know something's wrong. And in policing, we have this principle, in the US at least, called the fruit of the poisonous tree. And when you build something on, some, uh, on a foundation that's untruthful, it will eventually collapse. The sooner the better, because we have to allow access to these substances to not only our police, but our civilians. Our governments know they're safe. Many of the substances listed on Schedule 1 are actually not addictive. Some people say they're anti-addictive. <clears throat> Schedule 1 blocks access to psycho-spiritual religious development, resilience, and capacity expansion of our first responders and experts, as well as medical access to these substances. The reason is because there's heavy stigma around getting a diagnostic label to access medicine. My friends here talked about that. If you get labeled with a, la uh, a diagnostic label, if you get labeled with depression or PTSD or anxiety, you have some serious problems. And if your whole life is built on that paycheck, it can be catastrophic. So what do we know? These numbers are for uh, the United States. On an average career, police are exposed to 200 plus critical incidents in a career. Now a critical incident, just one is enough to send somebody's life sideways. Just imagine a nervous system that has over 200 in it. And then when the person pops, we act surprised. Really? Come on. We die five to 10 years after retirement. Guys, that's 10 to 20 years before our civilian brothers and sisters. Is that related to the trauma? I think so. We die by suicide at a rate two to three times higher than others in the population. More officers die by suicide than attack on the street. We survive our careers with subclinical PTSD, depression, and anxiety, and our divorce rates are through the roof. We have a problem. You know, and when I call 911, or my wife calls 911, I want somebody that's well, that's rested, that's resilient, to show up to the house to help out. I'm sure everybody in this room does as well. Talking about the evidence base that already exists, Australia said there is enough of an evidence base to start prescribing MDMA and psilocybin, and we're still waiting. I mentioned the non-addictive or anti-addictive nature of some of these substances. I have firsthand experience about this, and I will touch base on it, and I am going to intentionally go over my time. Many of these substances are already recognized as sacred sacramental compounds by the federal government in the United States. What's that about? How can they be sacred sacramental compounds and Schedule One at the same time? We lose over 100,000 people a year in the United States to substances labeled medicines while we keep plants on Schedule One 
and send our enforcers in to kick doors down and arrest people in high-stakes situations with weapons pulled out and pointed at human beings. <clears throat> Two final points. I wanted to share with you um, how I accessed MDMA in the United States. I was lucky enough to run across a gentleman named Rick Doblin at a Chiefs of Police conference where he presented phase two clinical trial results that show almost 70% of people who get MDMA-assisted therapy have their treatment-resistant severe PTSD pushed into sustained remission. This is still not available to people. He was able to get me into a federally sanctioned research protocol for healthy normals for me to be able to access pharmaceutical grade MDMA paired with therapy. What I experienced was numinous love and sacred gratitude for everything that went into me being who I am in this present moment. It changed my life forever. I have also been blessed with being able to access psilocybin and 5-MeO-DMT in a sacred religious context because luckily in the United States of America that is a constitutionally protected right. Here's my final point. In front of you all, I'd like to call upon the Biden administration to immediately do away with Schedule One. It's a lie. It's killing our first responders, and our people. Enough's enough. Thank you. Thank you all, appreciate that very much. So we got about five minutes, so I wanna open things up to everybody. I just want to ask one quick question. I just want everybody to be very brief in any responses, but especially Fabian and, and Neil from what you guys shared. So we talk a lot about stigma, and we talk about the fact that we want access, and we're asking for everybody's assistance. But we have been, as police officers, told that people that use drugs are bad, people that use drugs are dirty, and that the war on drugs is needed because we need to control those people. So we're asking, now officers to break that stigma and gain access. So especially based on, the on your personal stories that you shared, and thank you for sharing those. What do we need to do to break down that stigma for officers so we make sure that they understand that, no, people that use drugs are the same, they're us. We all use drugs and we need to stop that stigma. What is our word of advice to our brothers and sisters that wear that uniform every day? Mm, I think um, um, it's important, uh, as Neil say, as I, I do in France, to uh, speak about that publicly, uh, because um, I think cops uh, inside have many, many, many open mind, but with the group, uh, it's difficult, and I think, as um, as Neil, as everybody here, uh, we can started um, one other things uh, to make uh, cops share with trust. Yeah, I think that's a good point. There's not much I can add to that, is other than that we just need to keep talking about this. And with that in mind, Leap, we have this is the beginning of a campaign for us today. The beginning. We will be doing events wherever we're invited. So please invite us. Uh, we, 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 we will replicate this and, and other work 
uh, wherever we're invited, but we will. But we also have many points in the calendar uh, for the next three years. This is a long-term commitment for us to get people talking about this topic because it's it, it's the it's the right st strategy to be talking about this, breaking down the stigma. And we, when we get the first cops in multiple countries receiving treatment, and that treatment is public knowledge, then we will consider this a victory, and we we won't stop until we have a victory. Thank you both. Appreciate that. So with that, we will open things up to questions. On the, in the very back, sir, and then I'll get to you, sir. So. Hi, Nate Landa for the Veterans Action Council. First of all, thank you so much for all your courage of sharing your stories. I know it's not easy. We as veterans really identify our suicide rate in the United States as 22 per day, and that's just what's reported. On a military level, it's a federal agency, so it's not going to be easy, but the reform is top down. How can we help you on a local level? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, polices are either regulated by the city council or by the state. How can we help you on a local level? Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So I definitely think that, I'll speak from, from the U.S. perspective, I think pairing up more on the bill that you all were able to pass on a federal level to get access for veterans, which was amazing. I think to be able to do that more on a state-by-state -state level, um, which I think is what's probably needed for police, um, would be uh, some amazing work. So I think if we could touch base on that, I think that that is exactly what's needed. So thank you and I appreciate, thank you for all of your work all the way around, um, but especially on this, very much appreciate it. Yes, sir. Again, uh, also with Veterans Action Council, Michael Krowitz, um, really appreciate your, your exposing your heart today and uh, sharing your experiences. Um, our work uh, involved adding post-traumatic stress as a qualifying condition under state medical marijuana laws, recognizing that the FDA was taking too long and that we weren't getting the medicines that we wanted in the, in the pharmacy. Um, that was wildly successful, but although we've been characterized as wanting you know, heroin and soda machines or whatever, it's not true, and actually, we've talked at great length with Rick, uh, Rick Doblin, about these issues because, well, cannabis is a palliative, a symptomatic relief that can be given to a wide array of patients as a take-home medicine. You're talking about inpatient a psychotherapy-assisted, uh, I mean, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. So how do we bridge that? I mean, we until we have FDA-approved medicines and still we have uh, you know, actual uh, places where you can go receive this inpatient care, how do we deal with the market demand that's being met by storefronts and access, uh, which, again, is not something that we approve of generally uh, for this type of treatment because of the nature of its uh, inpatient uh, you know, success. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a good point, but I think it's, it's more complicated than that because people need different types of therapy. And actually, I, I mean, I speak to a lot of people who provide therapy that's happening now on the underground. And most recently, I met somebody who assists both military and police around Europe do psychedelic therapy using psilocybin in, in Amsterdam. And his point was that he fills the gap in people's needs because he doesn't provide that therapy. Uh, he, he just provides the setting... And, uh, and coaches them before using it. Now, you could argue that that is, is risky. You could argue, and some people will argue, that that's risky. However, there is a extraordinary success from that very simple, very simple underground uh, application of these chemicals. And that for some people, just access to the drug is all they need. They don't really need to complicate it. They don't need to be meth medicalized or, or, uh, in, necessarily in that way, which is why we need an open dialogue about this. We need to be working out exactly what people need. We need to be flexible about it and sometimes simple about it, which of course means that apart from campaigning specifically for access to uh, well-designed psychedelic therapies, we, all, we also just need to be campaigning to decriminalize this and increase access so that people have that choice. So in, in a way, the campaign also needs to be about making this as simple as possible.
Thank you so much for your presentations. My name is Aril Knudsen. I'm from Norway. I'm calling myself a drug user representative. I have tears in my eyes and goosebumps. So I want to thank you. And uh, your message is so important and so strong. And you're here and you're in conferences and you're uh, a lot in the media, at least Neil Woods, I know. But please make your statements in videos and spread them because it really got to, needs to get through. But I want to ask you one thing. Um, if you could give me a short explanation about you have been the first line uh, prohibitionists. What made you uh, change your mind? What, what exactly happened that you're sitting here now from that till this conference? What was the turning point? Thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll give a quick answer, which is you just see the futility of it all, you know? You see how it doesn't make any difference. It's like, is it King Canute's, like trying to stop the sea coming in? Or is that the, you, it, it doesn't work. You know, it really doesn't work. And I suppose eventually, because policing of uh, the, the drug war is exciting, actually. It's all the, you know, lots of kit and equipment and exciting operations. So it's, it's, it, it, it really sort of drives you a bit crazy because you, you realize it's making zero difference. Actually, what it's doing, what we have been doing, is making it worse. Um, and I don't know how many years it took me to realize that, but yeah, I realize it. And then, and then you change what you do, and, and you sit in places like this and tell people, because I think it has, it's, a, it's quite powerful coming from us, maybe. So we already know this as well, but the answer to hate is love. And I love my friends and family who have relationships with intoxicating substances, as well as the ones that don't. Uh, hello, thank you so much. And I will try to be very quick. I'm Linus Tavares from uh, Eurasian Harm Reduction Association and Young Wave uh, Lithuania. So first question is about uh, approach to psychedelic therapy. Is there some discussion about, uh, among you about paying attention to also indigenous knowledge system, ethical guidelines provided by indigenous communities or dialogue with them, and not only approaching through rigid Western scientific approach, but also spirit medicinal? And the second one, are there any initiatives from LEAP side towards war-torn countries, like, for example, law enforcement in Ukraine, we have catastrophic numbers of people who has PTSD. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, good questions. Um, I, I mean, we're not the experts in how we formulate the structures of these therapies, but it, we, I'm working on, there's lots of us working on this in a lot of detail, and, and you make a good point because there are hundreds and hundreds of years of expertise from shamanistic traditions, which is essentially different types of therapy, it's ways of using this and, and, and incorporating it into community consciousness, uh, it, that people's um, experiences need to be understood afterwards, and the shamanistic experience caters for that in terms of, a, of philosophical thinking. So there is a risk in over-medicalizing this and not learning the lessons of what's been practiced for a long time. And I think we need to sort of fix, fit that, in, hardwire that into our thinking uh, about psychedelics uh, as, as we learn, because we've got many decades of learning about this to come, to be fair, uh, because we've had uh, scientific censorship preventing access to this for the last 50 years. So we need to be aware of that shamanistic tradition. And the second point, we actually have uh, representatives from Ukraine who are actually in the audience who are looking after Ukrainian veterans, and we know them. And I I've also met uh, several Ukrainian police officers who are, who are actually keen on, on, on accessing this for their citizens as well. So this is part of our discussions, and it is actually part of our considerations that in pushing this agenda for police officers, we also are pushing this agenda for every single person that needs it around the world. And we have a catastrophe going on at the moment in Ukraine, and there are a lot of people who need this therapy immediately. So we, we have that very much in mind in saying the things that we do uh, today at this panel. Hello to all these wonderful people. We are the people mentioned um, from Ukraine who supervise veterans 
when having psychedelic therapy. Uh, it's been since 2014 when we started to have issues with Russia and uh, it was in the form of war, of combat situations, so we had lots of veterans since then, and that amount of suicides, that amount of alcohol issues uh, were so terrific that um, I decided to start having psychedelic sessions for veterans in Kyiv, in Ukraine. And... Uh, what I've seen, what I witnessed, uh, pushed me to here today because I saw so many stories of uh, people who released their traumas, who released their pain in one single session. It took like six, seven hours to forget all the pain, all the violence they witnessed, and to start living from a new, clear background. So I'm really thankful to you for sharing, for doing what you are doing, and I'm completely sure that this time is now when we uh, have no choice but to uh, make psychedelic therapy legal for people. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all. We appreciate all of your attention so early in the morning. You all enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I know a few of us will be here. Uh, if anybody else has any other questions, uh, enjoy the rest of your day, enjoy the rest of your week, and thank you all for all of you that you are all doing. Thank you.